Section 12 of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 1, 1835 to 1842, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Goloshes of Fortune, Part 2. The Eventful Moment, A Most Unusual Journey. Every inhabitant of Copenhagen knows what the entrance to Frederick's Hospital is like. But as most probably a few of those who read this little tale may not reside in Copenhagen, we'll give a short description of it. The hospital is separated from the street by an iron railing in which the bars stand so wide apart that, it is said, some very slim patients have squeezed through and gone to pay little visits in the town. The most difficult part of the body to get through was the head, and in this case, as it often happens in the world, the small heads were the most fortunate. This will serve as sufficient introduction to our tale. One of the young volunteers, of whom, physically speaking, it might be said that he had a great head, was on guard that evening at the hospital. The rain was pouring down, yet in spite of these two obstacles he wanted to go out just for a quarter of an hour. It was not worth while, he thought, to make a confidant of the porter, as he could easily slip through the iron railings. There lay the galoshes, which the watchman had forgotten. It never occurred to him that these could be galoshes of fortune. They would be very serviceable to him in this rainy weather, so he drew them on. Now came the question whether he could squeeze through the railings. He certainly had never tried, so he stood looking at them. I wish to goodness my head was through, said he, and instantly, though it was so thick and large, it slipped through quite easily. The galoshes answered that purpose very well. But his body had to follow, and this was impossible. I am too fat, he said. I thought my head would be the worst part, but I cannot get my body through, that's certain. And then he tried to pull his head back again, but without success. He could move his neck about easily enough, and that was all. His first feeling was one of anger, and then his spirits sank below zero. The galoshes of fortune had placed him in this terrible position, and unfortunately it never occurred to him to wish himself free. No, instead of wishing, he kept twisting about, yet he did not stir from the spot. The rain poured and not a creature could be seen in the street. The porter's bell he was unable to reach, and however was he to get loose? He foresaw that he should have to stay there till morning, and then they must send for a smith to file away the iron bars, and that would be a work of time. All the charity children would just be going to school, and all the sailors who inhabited that quarter of the town would be there to see him standing in the pillory. What a crowd there would be! Ha! he cried. The blood is rushing to my head, and I shall go mad. I believe I am crazy already. Oh, I wish I were free. Then all these sensations would pass off. Well, this is just what he ought to have said at first. The moment he had expressed the thought, his head was free. He started back, quite bewildered with the fright which the galoshes of fortune had caused him. But we must not suppose it was all over. No, indeed, there was worse to come yet. The night passed, and the whole of the following day, but no one sent for the galoshes. In the evening, a declamatory performance was to take place at the amateur theatre in a distant street. The house was crowded. Among the audience was the young volunteer from the hospital, who seemed to have quite forgotten his adventures of the previous evening. He had on the galoshes. They had not been sent for, and as the streets were still very dirty, they were of great service to him. A new poem, entitled My Aunt's Spectacles, was being recited. It described these spectacles as possessing a wonderful power. If anyone put them on in a large assembly, the people appeared like cards, and the future events of ensuing years could be easily foretold by them. 
the idea struck him that he should very much like to have such a pair of spectacles for if used rightly they would perhaps enable him to see into the hearts of people which he thought would be more interesting than to know what was going to happen next year for future events would be sure to show themselves but the hearts of people never i can fancy what i should see in the whole row of ladies and gentlemen on the first seat if i could only look into their hearts that lady i imagine keeps a store for things of all descriptions how my eyes would wander about in that collection with many ladies i should no doubt find a large millinery establishment there is another that is perhaps empty and would be all the better for cleaning out there may be some well stored with good articles ah yes he sighed i know one in which everything is solid but a servant is there already and that is the only thing against it i dare say from many i should hear the words please to walk in i only wish i could slip into the hearts like a little tiny thought this was the word of command for the galoshes the volunteer shrunk up altogether and commenced a most unusual journey through the hearts of the spectators in the first row the first heart he entered was that of a lady but he thought he must have got into one of the rooms of an orthopedic institution where plaster casts of deformed limbs were hanging on the walls with this difference that the casts in the institution are formed when the patient enters but here they were formed and preserved after the good people had left these were casts of the bodily and mental deformities of the lady's female friends carefully preserved quickly he passed into another heart which had the appearance of a spacious holy church with the white dove of innocence fluttering over the altar gladly would he have fallen on his knees in such a sacred place but he was carried on to another heart still however listening to the tones of the organ and feeling himself that he had become another and a better man the next heart was also a sanctuary which he felt almost unworthy to enter it represented a mean garret in which lay a sick mother but the warm sunshine streamed through the window lovely roses bloomed in a little flower box on the roof two bluebirds sang of childlike joys and the sick mother prayed for a blessing on her daughter next he crept on his hands and knees through an overfilled butcher's shop there was meat nothing but meat wherever he stepped this was the heart of a rich respectable man whose name is doubtless in the directory then he entered the heart of this man's wife it was an old tumble-down pigeon house the husband's portrait served as a weathercock it was connected with all the doors which opened and shut just as the husband's decision turned the next heart was a complete cabinet of mirrors such as can be seen in the castle of rosenberg but these mirrors magnified in an astonishing degree in the middle of the floor sat like the grand llama the insignificant eye of the owner astonished at the contemplation of his own features at his next visit he fancied he must have got into a narrow needle case full of sharp needles oh thought he this must be the heart of an old maid but such was not the fact it belonged to a young officer who wore several orders and was said to be a man of intellect and heart the poor volunteer came out of the last heart in the row quite bewildered he could not collect his thoughts and he imagined his foolish fancies had carried him away good gracious he sighed i must have a tendency to softening of the brain and here it is so exceedingly hot that the blood is rushing to my head and then suddenly recurred to him the strange event of the evening before when his head had been fixed between the iron railings in front of the hospital that is the cause of it all he exclaimed i must do something in time a russian bath would be a very good thing to begin with i wish i were lying on one of the highest shelves sure enough there he lay on an upper shelf of a vapor bath still in his evening costume with his boots and galoshes on and the hot drops from the ceiling falling on his face ho he cried jumping down and rushing toward the plunging bath the attendant stopped him with a loud cry when he saw a man with all his clothes on 
The volunteer had, however, presence of mind enough to whisper, It is for a wager. But the first thing he did, when he reached his own room, was to put a large blister on his neck, and another on his back, that his crazy fit might be cured. The next morning his back was very sore, which was all he gained by the galoshes of fortune. Next, the clerk's transformation. The watchman, whom we of course have not forgotten, thought after a while of the galoshes which he had found and taken to the hospital. So he went and fetched them. But neither the lieutenant nor any one in the street could recognize them as their own. So he gave them up to the police. Why, they look exactly like my own galoshes, said one of the clerks, examining the unknown articles as they stood by the side of his own. It would require even more than the eye of a shoemaker to know one pair from the other. Master clerk, said a servant, who entered with some papers. The clerk turned and spoke to the man, but when he was done with him, he turned to look at the galoshes again, and now he was in greater doubt than ever as to whether the pair on the right or on the left belonged to him. Those that are wet must be mine, thought he, but he thought wrong. It was just the reverse. The galoshes of fortune were the wet pair, and besides, why should not a clerk in a police office be wrong sometimes? So he drew them on thrust his papers into his pockets, placed a few manuscripts under his arm, which he had to take with him, and to make abstracts from at home. Then, as it was Sunday morning, and the weather very fine, he said to himself, A walk to Fredericksburg will do me good. So away he went. There could not be a quieter or more steady young man than this clerk. We will not grudge him this little walk and it was just the thing to do him good after sitting so much. He went on at first like a mere automaton, without thought or wish. Therefore the galoshes had no opportunity to display their magic power. In the avenue he met with an acquaintance, one of our young poets, who told him that he intended to start on the following day on a summer excursion. Are you really going away so soon? asked the clerk. What a free, happy man you are! You can roam about where you will, while such as we are tied by the foot. But it is fastened to the bread-tree, replied the poet. You need have no anxiety for the morrow, and when you're old there is a pension for you. Ah, yes, but you have the best of it, said the clerk. It must be so delightful to sit and write poetry. The whole world makes itself agreeable to you, and then you are your own master. You should try how you would like to listen to all the trivial things in a court of justice. The poet shook his head. So also did the clerk. Each retained his own opinion. And so they parted. They are strange people, these poets, thought the clerk. I should like to try what it is to have a poetic taste and to become a poet myself. I am sure I should not write such mournful verses as they do. This is a splendid spring day for a poet. The air is so remarkably clear, the clouds are so beautiful, and the green grass has such a sweet smell. For many years I have not felt as I do at this moment. Now we perceive by these remarks that he had already become a poet. By most poets what he had said would be considered commonplace, or as the Germans call it, insipid. It is a foolish fancy to look upon poets as different to other men. There are many who are more the poets of nature than those who are professed poets. The difference is this. The poet's intellectual memory is better. He seizes upon an idea or a sentiment until he can embody it clearly and plainly in words which the others cannot do. But the transition from a character of everyday life to one of a more gifted nature is a great transition. And so the clerk became aware of the change after a time. What a delightful perfume, said he. It reminds me of the violets at Aunt Laura's. Ah, that was when I was a little boy. Dear me, how long it seems since I thought of those days. She was a good old maiden lady. She lived yonder, behind the exchange. She always had a sprig or a few blossoms in water. Let the winter be ever so severe. I could smell the violets, even while I was placing warm penny pieces against the frozen panes to make peep-holes, 
and the pretty view it was on which I peeped. Out in the river lay the ships, ice-bound and forsaken by their crews. A screaming crow represented the only living creature on board. But when the breezes of spring came, everything started into life. Amidst shouting and cheers, the ships were tarred and rigged, and then they sailed to foreign lands. I remain here, and always shall remain, sitting at my post at the police office, and letting others take passports to distant lands. Yes, this is my fate. And he sighed deeply. Suddenly he paused. Good gracious, what has come over me? I never felt before as I do now. It must be the air of spring. It is overpowering, and yet it is delightful. He felt in his pockets for some of his papers. These will give me something else to think of, said he. Casting his eyes on the first page of one, he read, Mistress Sigberth, an original tragedy in five acts. What is this? In my own handwriting, too. Have I written this tragedy? He read again. The Intrigue on the Promenade, or the Fast Day, a vaudeville. However did I get all this? Someone must have put them into my pocket. And here is a letter. It was from the manager of a theatre. The pieces were rejected, not at all in polite terms. Hm, hm, said he, sitting down on a bench. His thoughts were very elastic, and his heart softened strangely. Involuntarily he seized one of the nearest flowers. It was a little simple daisy. All that botanist can say in many lectures was explained in a moment by this little flower. It spoke of the glory of its birth. It told of the strength of the sunlight, which had caused its delicate leaves to expand, and given to it such sweet perfume. The struggles of life which arouse sensations in the bosom, have their type in the tiny flowers. Air and light are the lovers of the flowers, but light is the favored one. Towards light it turns, and only when light vanishes does it fold its leaves together and sleep in the embraces of the air. It is light that adorns me, said the flower. But the air gives you the breath of life, whispered the poet. Just by him stood a boy splashing with his stick in a marshy ditch. The water drops spurted up among the green twigs, and the clerk thought of the millions of animalculae which were thrown into the air with every drop of water, at a height which must be the same to them as it would be to us if we were hurled beyond the clouds. As the clerk thought of all these things, and became conscious of the great change in his own feelings, he smiled and said to himself, I must be asleep and dreaming, and yet, if so, how wonderful for a dream to be so natural and real, and to know at the same time, too, that it is but a dream. I hope I shall be able to remember it all when I wake to-morrow. My sensations seem most unaccountable. I have a clear perception of everything as if I were wide awake. I am quite sure, if I recollect all this to-morrow, it will appear utterly ridiculous and absurd. I have had this happen to me before. It's with the clever or wonderful things we say or hear in dreams, as with the gold which comes from under the earth. It is rich and beautiful when we possess it, but when seen in its true light it is but as stones and withered leaves. Ah, he sighed mournfully, as he gazed at the birds singing merrily, or hopping from branch to branch. They are much better off than I. Flying is a glorious power. Happy is he who is born with wings. Yes, if I could change myself into anything, I would be a little lark. At the same moment his coat-tails and sleeves grew together and formed wings. His clothes changed to feathers, and his goloshes to claws. He felt what was taking place, and laughed to himself. Well, now, it is evident. I must be dreaming. But I never had such a wild dream as this. And then he flew up into the green boughs and sang. But there was no poetry in the song, for his poetic nature had left him. The goloshes, like all persons who wished to do a thing thoroughly, could only attend to one thing at a time. He wished to be a poet, and he became one. Then he wanted to be a little bird, and in this change he lost the characteristics of the former one. Well, thought he, this is charming. 
by day i sit in a police office amongst the driest law papers and at night i can dream that i am a lark flying about in the gardens of fredericksburg really a complete comedy could be written about it and then he flew down into the grass turned his head about in every direction and tapped his beak on the bending blades of grass which in proportion to his size seemed to him as long as the palm leaves in northern africa in another moment all was darkness around him it seemed as if something immense had been thrown over him a sailor boy had flung his large cap over the bird and a hand came underneath and caught the clerk by the back and wings so roughly that he squeaked and then cried out in his alarm you impudent rascal i am a clerk in the police office but it only sounded to the boy like tweet tweet so he tapped the bird on the beak and walked away with him in the avenue he met two schoolboys who appeared to belong to a better class of society but whose inferior abilities kept them in the lowest class at school these boys bought the bird for eightpence and so the clerk returned to copenhagen it is well for me that i am dreaming he thought otherwise i should become really angry first i was a poet and now i am a lark it must have been the poetic nature that changed me into this little creature it is a miserable story indeed especially now i have fallen into the hands of boys i wonder what will be the end of it the boys carried him into a very elegant room where a stout pleasant-looking lady received them but she was not at all gratified to find that they had brought a lark a common field bird as she called it however she allowed them for one day to place the bird in an empty cage that hung near the window it will please polly perhaps she said laughing at a large gray parrot who was swinging himself proudly on a ring in a handsome brass cage it is polly's birthday she added in simpering tone and the little field bird has come to offer his congratulations polly did not answer a single word he continued to swing proudly to and fro but a beautiful canary who had been brought from his own warm fragrant fatherland the summer previous began to sing as loud as he could you screamer said the lady throwing a white handkerchief over the cage tweet tweet sighed he what a dreadful snowstorm and then he became silent the clerk or as the lady called him the field bird was placed in a little cage close to the canary and not far from the parrot the only human speech which polly could utter and which she sometimes chattered forth most comically was now let us be men all besides was a scream quite as unintelligible as the warbling of the canary bird excepting to the clerk who being now a bird could understand his comrades very well i flew beneath green palm trees and amidst the blooming almond trees sang the canary i flew with my brothers and sisters over beautiful flowers and across the clear bright sea which reflected the waving foliage in its glittering depths and i have seen many gay parrots who could relate long and delightful stories they were wild birds answered the parrot and totally uneducated now let us be men why do you not laugh if the lady and her visitors can laugh at this surely you can it is a great failing not to be able to appreciate what is amusing now let us be men do you remember said the canary the pretty maidens who used to dance in the tents that were spread out beneath the sweet blossoms do you remember the delicious fruit and the cooling juice from the wild herbs oh yes said the parrot but here i am much better off i am well fed and treated politely i know that i have a clever head and what more do i want let us be men now you have a soul for poetry i have deep knowledge and wit you have genius but no discretion you raise your naturally high notes so much that you get covered over they never serve me so oh no i cost them something more than you i keep them in order with my beak and fling my wit about me now let us be men oh my warm blooming fatherland sang the canary bird i will sing of thy dark green trees and thy quiet streams where the bending branches kiss the clear smooth water 
I will sing of the joy of my brothers and sisters as their shining plumage flits among the dark leaves of the plants which grow wild by the springs. Do leave off those dismal strains, said the parrot. Sing something to make us laugh. Laughter is the sign of the highest order of intellect. Can a dog or a horse laugh? No. They can cry. But to man alone is the power of laughter given. Ha, ha, ha! laughed Polly, and repeated his witty saying, Now let us be men. You, little grey Danish bird, said the canary, you also have become a prisoner. It is certainly cold in your forests, but still there is liberty there. Fly out. They have forgotten to close the cage, and the window is open at the top. Fly, fly. Instinctively the clerk obeyed, and left the cage. At the same moment, the half-open door leading into the next room creaked on its hinges, and stealthily, with green fiery eyes, the cat crept in and chased the lark round the room. The canary bird fluttered in his cage, and the parrot flapped his wings and cried, Let us be men. The poor clerk, in the most deadly terror, flew through the window, over the houses, and through the streets, till at length he was obliged to seek a resting place. A house opposite to him had a look of home a window stood open he flew in and perched upon the table it was his own room let us be men now said he involuntarily imitating the parrot and at the same moment he became a clerk again only that he was sitting on the table heaven preserve us said he how did i get up here and fall asleep in this way it was an uneasy dream too that i had the whole affair appears most absurd. Next, the best thing the galoshes did. Early on the following morning, while the clerk was still in bed, his neighbor, a young divinity student, who lodged on the same story, knocked at his door and then walked in. Lend me your galoshes, said he. It is so wet in the garden, but the sun is shining brightly. I should like to go out there and smoke my pipe. He put on the galoshes, and was soon in the garden, which contained only one plum tree and one apple tree. Yet, in a town, even a small garden like this is a great advantage. The student wandered up and down the path. It was just six o'clock, and he could hear the sound of the post-horn in the street. Oh, to travel, to travel, cried he. There is no greater happiness in the world. It is the height of my ambition. This restless feeling would be stilled if I could take a journey far away from this country. I should like to see beautiful Switzerland, to travel through Italy, and it was well for him that the galoshes acted immediately, otherwise he might have carried too far for himself as well as for us. In a moment he found himself in Switzerland, closely packed with eight others in the diligence. His head ached. His back was stiff, and the blood had ceased to circulate, so that his feet were swelled and pinched by his boots. He wavered in a condition between sleeping and waking. In his right-hand pocket he had a letter of credit. In his left-hand pocket was his passport, and a few louis d'ors were sewn into a little leather bag which he carried in his breast pocket. Whenever he dozed he dreamed that he had lost one or another of these possessions. Then he would awake with a start, and the first movements of his hand formed a triangle from his right-hand pocket to his breast, and from his breast to his left-hand pocket to feel whether they were all safe. Umbrellas, sticks, and hats swung in the net before him, and almost obstructed the prospect which was really very imposing, and as he glanced at it his memory recalled the words of one poet at least who has sung of Switzerland, and whose poems have not yet been printed. How lovely to my wandering eyes, Mont Blanc's fair summits gently rise, tis sweet to breathe the mountain air, if you have gold enough to spare. Grand, dark, and gloomy appeared the landscape around him. The pine forests looked like little groups of moss on high rocks, whose summits were lost in clouds of mist. Presently it began to snow and the wind blew keen and cold. Ah, he sighed, if I were only on the other side of the Alps now, it would be summer, 
and I should be able to get money on my letter of credit. The anxiety I feel on this matter prevents me from enjoying myself in Switzerland. Oh, I wish I was on the other side of the Alps. And there, in a moment, he found himself far away in the midst of Italy, between Florence and Rome, where the lake Thrasmene glittered in the evening sunlight like a sheet of molten gold between the dark blue mountains. There, where Hannibal defeated Flaminius, the grape vines clung to each other with the friendly grasp of their green tendril fingers, while by the wayside lovely half-naked children were watching a herd of coal-black swine under the blossoms of fragrant laurel. Could we rightly describe this picturesque scene? Our readers would exclaim, Delightful Italy! But neither the student nor either of his travelling companions felt the least inclination to think of it in this way. Poisonous flies and gnats flew into the coach by thousands. In vain they drove them away with a myrtle branch. The flies stung them notwithstanding. There was not a man in the coach whose face was not swollen and disfigured with the stings. The poor horses looked wretched. The flies settled on their back in swarms, and they were only relieved when the coachman got down and drove the creatures off. As the sun set, an icy coldness filled all nature, not, however, of long duration. It produced the feeling which we experience when we enter a vault at a funeral on a summer's day, while the hills and the clouds put on that singular green hue which we often notice in old paintings and look upon as unnatural until we have ourselves seen nature's coloring in the south. It was a glorious spectacle, but the stomachs of the travelers were empty. Their bodies were exhausted with fatigue, and all the longings of their heart turned toward a resting place for the night. But where to find one they knew not. All the eyes were too eagerly seeking for this resting place to notice the beauties of nature. The road passed through a grove of olive trees. It reminded the student of the willow trees at home. Here stood a lonely inn, and close by it a number of crippled beggars had placed themselves. The brightest among them looked, to quote the words of Marriott, like the eldest son of famine who had just come of age. The others were either blind or had withered legs, which obliged them to creep about on their hands and knees, or they had shriveled arms and hands without fingers. It was indeed poverty arrayed in rags. Excellenza miserabili, they exclaimed, stretching forth their diseased limbs. The hostess received the travellers with bare feet, untidy hair, and a dirty blouse. The doors were fastened together with string. The floors of the room were of brick, broken in many places. Bats flew about under the roof, and as to the odour within— Let us have supper laid in the stable, said one of the travellers then we shall know what we are breathing the windows were opened to let in a little fresh air but quicker than air came in the withered arms and the continual whining sounds of miserabili excellenza on the walls were inscriptions half of them against la bella italia the supper made its appearance at last it consisted of watery soup seasoned with pepper and rancid oil this last delicacy played a principal part in the salad. Musty eggs and roasted coxcombs were the best dishes on the table. Even the wine had a strange taste. It was certainly a mixture. At night all the boxes were placed against the doors, and one of the travellers watched while the others slept. The student's turn came to watch. How close the air felt in that room! The heat overpowered him. The gnats were buzzing about and stinging, while the miserable outside moaned in their dreams. Travelling would be all very well, said the student of divinity to himself, if we had no bodies, or if the body could rest while the soul is flying. Wherever I go, I feel a want which oppresses my heart, for something better presents itself at the moment. Yes, something better. Which shall be the best of all? But where is that to be found? 
In fact, I know in my heart very well what I want. I wish to attain the greatest of all happiness. No sooner were the words spoken than he was at home. Long white curtains shaded the windows of his room, and in the middle of the floor stood a black coffin in which he now lay in the still sleep of death. His wish was fulfilled, his body was at rest, and his spirit travelling. Esteem no man happy until he is in his grave, were the words of Solon. Here was a strong, fresh proof of their truth. Every corpse is a sphinx of immortality. The sphinx in this sarcophagus might unveil its own mystery in the words which the living had himself written two days before. Stern death, thy chilling silence waketh dread. Yet in thy darkest hour there may be light. Earth's garden reaper, from the grave's cold bed, the soul on Jacob's ladder takes her flight. Man's greatest sorrows often are a part of hidden griefs, concealed from human eyes, which press far heavier on the lonely heart than now the earth that on his coffin lies. Two figures were moving about the room. We know them both. One was the fairy named Care, the other the messenger of fortune. They bent over the dead. Look, said Care. What happiness have your galoshes brought to mankind? They have at least brought lasting happiness to him who slumbers here, she said. Not so, said Care. He went away of himself. He was not summoned. His mental powers were not strong enough to discern the treasures which he had been destined to discover. I will do him a favor now. And she drew the galoshes from his feet. The sleep of death was ended, and the recovered man raised himself. Care vanished, and with her the galoshes. Doubtless she looked upon them as her own property. End of section 12